The truce between Israel and Hamas was not announced by the key parties locked in a cycle of violence, but rather by the Foreign Minister of Egypt and the Secretary of State of the U.S. For more on the role that international actors are playing in the Middle East conflict and truce, we're joined now by Besma Momani. She's Senior Fellow at CG, the Centre for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario. It's nice to have you back here at TVO, Besma. Thank you. Let's provide some context to the events that have been transpiring in the Middle East for the past week, week and a half or so, by looking at some of the major actors, starting with Israel and Hamas. The nature or state of their relationship between them prior to all of this violence was what? Well, tenuous at best, uh, perhaps even an unrelationship, if anything. Um, obviously, these two uh, sides have uh, been declared war with each other, and, and we've seen that both in 2008 and again in the past eight days. The relationship between Hamas, which controls the Gaza, and Fatah, which controls the West Bank. What was that like before all of this broke out? Competitors in many ways, competitors for the hearts and minds of Palestinians, competitors in terms of who's the more legitimate actor representing the Palestinian people, and obviously two very different views and versions of how to move forward uh, in representing the Palestinian people. So the rapprochement that we saw very high profile about a year or so ago, you don't buy it. No, absolutely not. I think they're very much competitors, and in fact, we uh, are seeing now uh, perhaps even more, uh, uh, more criticism of Abbas uh, by the Palestinian people. So perhaps Hamas has, has actually gained in that, uh, in that respect. Okay, those are the two main players. Let's now talk about some of the other players who apparently are very influential in all of this as well, starting with Egypt. Led, of course, by a, a president who is with the Muslim Brotherhood, which, of course, has very close ties with Hamas. How would you characterize the relationship between Egypt's new government and Hamas, again, prior to all of the events of the past week and a half? Well, you know, in many ways, people have been writing about the fact that they're sort of ideological brethren, that, you know, Hamas is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, but I would say that it probably wasn't nearly as close as everyone has really predicted. There's clearly uh, a closer relationship between these two ideologically than, let's say, perhaps the previous government of Mubarak, which had an antagonistic relationship at best with Hamas. Uh, but, you know, one can't assume that, that Hamas is in the pocket of the Muslim Brotherhood. They're very independent actors in that way. And although there may be some ideological similarities, I think they're very independent actors. At that. But Morsi was a key to getting this thing done, yes? Absolutely. I mean, I think he decided to be a statesman. Uh, and I think that's really interesting for Egypt, uh, for the international uh, community's uh, uh, involvement and perspective of how the Middle East crisis can, can move forward. Uh, Morsi has really, I think, uh, raised the stakes of, uh, of, of, of his name and uh, probably increased his own reputation internationally as and a result. In spite of it all, Hamas apparently listens to him, yes? I think Hamas uh, wanted to, to, to move on, uh, and I think that uh, definitely Morsi was able to, to have the ear of Hamas, and that's really important in these circumstances as, as it proved uh, to be very useful. Um, so absolutely, there was a, a direct line of communication uh, between Hamas and the, uh, and the Morsi government, and that was effective in uh, brokering the ceasefire. There are a lot of very interesting slash unusual theories going around mm -hmm. about some of the other players in this. And I want to put one past you here, and you tell me whether you think this has any credence. Iran, which has provided these longer-range missiles to Hamas, encouraged Hamas to increase its rocket attacks against Israel because that diverts attention away from Iran's nuclear program for however long these rocket attacks and, and the war has been going on. You buy that? No. I, I mean, I think there's going to be lots of theories. This is the Middle East, after all. There's always at least 25 different interpretations for the same event. I don't think that this really serves the Iranian purpose in sort of highlighting uh, the fact that uh, Iran has its, uh, what is clearly some, some sort of relationship with Hamas. This is not when he, it's trying to divert attention away from its nuclear file problem. The last thing it wants to do is bring itself back into the news. And this clearly brought itself back into the news, most importantly in the United States, which uh, we saw in Congress, for example, and many on the right uh, you know, further pointing this in the framework or pointing out this conflict as uh, to be interpreted in the case of uh, understanding the situation with Iran. So I think it's, it's, it's probably not healthy for Iran. And if, if we sort of take the premise, which I think many in, in the international, uh, at least academic community, think of Iran as being a rational actor, and you may not like what they say and do, but they are a rational actor, this is probably not in their interest. Uh, okay, but uh, yeah, back in the news, but back in the news because of its relationship with the missiles in Hamas, not back in the news as a result of the nuclear program. For two weeks now, it, Ira you know, Iran's nuclear program has not been front and center when people think about that region. That's in their interest, isn't it? Well, I mean, at the same time, I have to say that, you know, during this whole past eight days, 
Uh, we didn't see a lot coming out of Iran, not a lot of speeches, not a lot of you know, commenting. I think that if it really wanted to take credit, we would have seen a lot of the kind of speechifying that we are tended to, to, to expect from the Iranians, which says something to me that you know, this is not necessarily in their interest now. Were they okayed? Uh, were they sort of, you know, was it, there was a check on making sure that uh, uh, they were permitted, so to speak, to, to do this? Probably. I mean, I think that, you know, there is definitely communication between Hamas and, and, and Iran. Uh, but I don't think this really serves Iran's purpose. This was really done, I think, independently. Uh, Hamas's calculations uh, to do this was for their own purposes. And uh, one can argue whether that was right or wrong. But nevertheless, I think it's very much an independent decision. Okay, let's take a look at another country in the area, Syria. Mm -hmm. The Syrian opposition was able to make some pretty impressive and important military and diplomatic gains over the last week and a half. And again, the suggestion is that Iran encourages Hamas to act in the way that it did to sway international attention away from the losses that Bashar al-Assad has been facing as president of Syria. Possible? I think that's putting too many actors in a room. You know, you're putting together Hamas, the Iranians, and the Syrians all in one as though they, uh, you know, uh, have this kind of uh, uh, planning and scheming. Uh, the reality is, yes, the diversion uh, to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, problem definitely helped Assad. Uh, that he is the benefactor, in my opinion, over the past eight days. And therefore, that helps Iran. I, well, yes and no, but I don't think that, you know, it would, uh, I don't think it's literally that easy to just make the phone call. Um, and again, uh, you know, unless we can prove it, it's, it's really hard to sort of argue that. I do think that there is more important kind of calculations happening domestically uh, within Hamas to say that, you know, this is a way to, you know, uh, remind the, the Palestinian people that uh, Mahmoud Abbas, who's about to go to the General Assembly, um, you know, that that's not the way to move forward, that in fact, you know, a militarized option, which is often with the, you know, the sort of slogan they pursue, um, is the more uh, uh, expedient way of getting the results. And, and effectively, they're able to remove the blockade, which is a huge coup uh, for Hamas. So I don't think it's enough to really implicate the Iranians in this. Uh, but, you know, this is, as an academic, I say, let's wait 25 years till we have all the evidence. Um, <laughs> you don't mind if I just wait another 30 seconds, because I'm going to, we're going to try this again. Again, yeah. uh, it seemed as if Israel and, and uh, Hamas were not all that interested in getting a ceasefire. And yet here is Iran, here is Egypt, here is Syria, who are peripheral players in some respects to all of this, and yet with varying degrees of influence on what has just transpired. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how much you think those three other countries, how much influence they had in the fact that there appears to be a ceasefire at the moment anyway? So, so Egypt and, sorry. Egypt, Syria, Iran, were they influential in getting the ceasefire? Egypt we know, but what about the others? No, I don't think so. No? I mean, I think that it's, it's, you know, again, conspiracy theories are going to be uh, out there to, to suggest. I always find these kinds of arguments of having all these people somehow uh, coordinating, uh, um, you know, master, masterminding the Middle East is, is often unconvincing to me. I think there was real domestic, local interest in pursuing this, both for Hamas and the Israelis, and they did them for their own particular reasons in-house. Um, but to really put this in, in the frame of reference that somehow it requires all of these other actors involved is, I think, um, you know, removing the, the, the reality of what uh, is is really a very uh, domestic and local problem. Okay, we haven't talked about the biggest player yet, so let's do that. Mm -hmm. The United States, what do the events of the last week, week and a half suggest about how much influence the U.S. still has in the region? Well, I think, you know, this is really interesting because, you know, you saw uh, President Obama in Myanmar really trying to make this whole Asian Pacific thing his his real forte and then to be diverted by all this uh, happening in the Middle East. But, you know, him sending Hillary Clinton with, I think, a lot of goodies, a lot of promises. Uh, clearly, they, uh, you know, not only promised the Israelis uh, more money and more resources toward the Iron Dome, uh, they obviously promised more money to the um, Egyptians, particularly radar technology to help and, and root out some of these tunnels uh, between Gaza and, uh, and Egypt. So it definitely came with you know, some backing. And we saw a lot of shuttle diplomacy that was really interesting, uh, both going to Jerusalem and to uh, Ramallah, uh, and then going to, to uh, Egypt and Cairo. So I think that, you know, this really did help. Uh, you know, perhaps Morsi is taking a lot more credit. We should be giving some to Clinton as well. Uh, but I think this is definitely a very interesting sort of final uh, hurrah for uh, Mrs. Clinton. Well, let me follow up on that, because I, I've heard it said that, yes, Hillary Clinton came in, but only after everything was already done. In, in essence, she walked into a, what was a fait accompli, yeah. and of course, yeah, can take the victory lap because she's there, she's the Secretary of State. Do you think that's accurate? 
Well, you know, I mean, I think that usually when we sort of ha look for these so-called Kodak moments, you know, it would be Barack Obama coming in. So I think the fact that we see, you know, the Secretary of State uh, doing all these shuttle diplomacy back and forth, I think she had some, I think she had some way into this. I think it's unfair to suggest that this is uh, completely uh, orchestrated uh, before her arrival. Uh, you know, I think that uh, clearly it required some. Uh, some backing, uh, financial and military, uh, to get this uh, uh, finally dotted. But I think ultimately she does deserve some credit. And implications for Morsi if the ceasefire does not hold? Well, I mean, Morsi's got a lot on his plate right now. I mean, there's really a lot of criticism domestically in Egypt about how he's consolidating his power. Uh, but yes, the stakes are really high. Uh, one of the things he has to do in the agreement is, is obviously prevent the continuation of, of rockets and, and missiles coming through. Um, that's going to be a, a big priority for him. And obviously, uh, meeting the desires of the domestic public, which wants to see the lifting of the blockade. Here's David Frum. Uh, writing yesterday, the former White House speechwriter and well-known conservative advocate. Morsi seems the big winner of the Gaza War. $4.8 billion in IMF loans, plus power by decree in return for stopping the rockets. Sweet. So says David Frum. What do you say? I think that's putting too many connections together. I don't think this had much to do with the IMF loans, even though people will try to, to argue it that way. Um, you know, the IMF loans have been well negotiated in advance. Although there's an IMF team in Cairo today, that's really, I think, a very separate uh, conversation. Uh, and some would argue that, you know, an IMF loan is not necessarily a treat. <laughs> a lot of strings come attached to those loans? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. In which case, we've talked about sort of the relationship among the different players before the events of the last week and change happened. Let's talk about where the main players are now. Mm -hmm. uh, post ceasefire. Mm -hmm. Where's Hamas at right now? What's their standing in the world? Well, Hamas has gained politically. I mean, it's gained on the streets of Gaza. It's perhaps even gained on the streets of many Arab countries. Uh, so politically, it looks stronger, uh, even though militarily, it's probably a lot weaker. Um, I think the Israelis, I mean, one could argue that perhaps Netanyahu looks stronger. He's been able to, you know, solidify his coalition on the right. He's been able to effectively divert attention away from socioeconomic issues, which had been, you know, really rising throughout the summer in the past year. He's been able to divert attention away from a big debate on secularism in, in Israeli society. So perhaps he's a winner. Um, and he's got an election pretty he's soon. He's got an election in January, and, and he's likely to do well. Um, so I think that, you know, those are... are, are you know, two factors. Um, Egypt, Morsi looks stronger. He looks like he's a statesman. Uh, he's been able to, I think, uh, uh, remove the uh, international uh, suspicion that's been on him as being an Islamist government. Is this going to be a government that's going to be warmongering and so forth? And we saw farther from the truth. In fact, you know, he was able to broker a truce. So he's definitely looking good at this moment. Iran? The Iranians, again, very quiet. I mean, this is really interesting. We didn't see a lot of activity come out of Iran, although we see today the foreign ministers in Syria. Uh, there will be likely some sort of attempt to uh, return uh, the focus on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which always serves them well. I mean, the more that they can sort of say, look at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and don't look at the fact that, you know, uh, Bashar al-Assad has killed 40,000 people as of yesterday. The fact that in the week we saw 150 Palestinians killed in, in the Israeli uh, onslaught, but at the same time, we saw that same amount daily by the Assad regime over the past 20 months. So, I mean, the, the more they can focus the, you know, the Arab and Muslims world attention on the Arab-Israeli conflict and less on what's happening uh, in Syria, the better for Iran, obviously. America's standing in the region after all of the events. What do you see it as now? Well, it's been a roller coaster ride for the Americans. I mean, you know, going from the speech of Obama in Cairo from a long time ago to a low, obviously. I think, you know, some of his statements in Myanmar uh, challenged his position in, in the Arab and Muslim world. I mean, people were expecting perhaps more forceful support uh, for some sort of cessation of violence. And, and in fact, uh, we didn't really see that come out of Obama. So he, he may have lost some points. But I think that, you know, people are perhaps thankful at the diplomatic level, at the government level, that the Americans were able to come in uh, even at the very last moment to sort of help this move to ceasefire because nobody wanted this conflict prolonged. Uh, it wasn't going to serve anybody in their interests uh, in the region in the long run. we got about a minute and change left here, and I do want to ask you one last thing about Egypt because mm -hmm. besides all of what we've just talked about, we are now seeing clashes in Tahrir Square because the president has decided to grant to himself sweeping new powers. We've yeah. seen Mohamed el Baradai, the former head of the uh, Atomic, International Atomic Energy Association, the former candidate for president, say that Morsi is appointing himself Egypt's new pharaoh. The events of the past week have anything to do with Morsi's power play, do you think? Well, I think that, you know, this, is, this consolidation of power that Morsi has been trying to achieve uh, in the past few months, I think this was 
you know, for him, perfect timing. He took what was international praise for a day and then the very next day went to uh, consolidate his power. Uh, you know, there's been a long uh, debate in, in Egypt right now between both, the, you know, to be very general, Islamists and secularists with, um, uh, or I should say, secularist liberals uh, mm -hmm. with the Islamists and, and sort of, you know, what role should Islam play in society? And he has uh, uh, obviously been also trying to consolidate his power to take more control away from the judiciary. So this has played out in the backdrop of uh, a very sort of polarized debate in society today, and uh, I think Morsi is, is going to face a lot of challenges because uh, much of the liberals and secularists in the countries are going to feed off of this very, uh, very drastic uh, move by, uh, by Morsi. Thanks so much for making the drive in from Waterloo. Thank you. Appreciate your help on this. Besma Momani, the senior fellow at CG. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.